run to him whenever there's any trouble or any doubt. Um, before I start, I want to say um, there are a couple of you, and I won't say who they are, a couple of you we haven't seen in a while, but we are happy to see you today. You know who you are, so <laughs> we're happy to see you today. <laughs> it's, we're so happy that we're beginning to, 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 to meet together, and as, as we go further along, as we go further along, it's going to get better. We're going to have more people in here, and we're going to – I'm not going to say that we're going to enjoy ourselves more because we have a great time now. So I want, but I, so I want you to, to feel comfortable and uh, know that we love seeing you. So let's get into the message. Um, my text today is comes from the scripture that Gene read, but my text is going to be uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, I'm reading from the NIV, if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under foot. Now, we all know that that's from the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, without question, the Sermon on the Mount as recorded in Matthew chapter 5, verse through chapter 7, has been more widely discussed probably than any writing of equal length. Uh, many Bible scholars actually believe that the best known fact about Jesus is that he gave the Sermon on the Mount. As we go through this series of sermons, we're going to have a series of sermons uh, on the uh, Sermon on the Mount, as we go through this series of sermons, a title kind of the series, Listening to Heaven's Infallible Teacher, and that's Jesus. So I encourage you as we go through this, it's going to be several weeks, as we, as we go through this series, I encourage you to read the entire Sermon on the Mount, and that's in Matthew, Matthew chapter 5 through 7. If you remember, we started off last year, 2020, with a series on the Beatitudes, uh, which is one of the main parts of the sermon that we're going to be talking about for the next several weeks. In that series, we said that the Beatitudes, which mean extreme blessing, was a way to happen. Uh, Matthew, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12, it says, Best are the poor in spirit, best are those who mourn, best are the meek, best are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, Blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Now, little did we know when we started that series at the beginning of the year that we were really going to need these extreme blessings in 2020 with COVID and the civil and racial unrest plus all of the other stuff, difficulties that happened last year. And it looks like this year, maybe though maybe not as bad, it's not going to be that great either. I don't want to get into it. I digress. So let me get to the message. <laughs> if, we want to, if you want to re review those sermons, by the way, uh, from last year, uh, check with me. I have all the manuscripts, and I can actually... Uh, uh, get you to a, an audio recording of all those sermons. So if you're, if you're interested. Now, after the, after, the Beatitudes, after the Beatitudes, Jesus offers a series of teachings that, if incorporated in our lives, would revolutionize, re re revolutionize our very existence. Now, Matthew 5, 13, our text for today, Jesus made a very pointed statement. He said, you are the salt of the earth. And in this statement, Jesus has given us an expression that has become one of the finest compliments that we can, that we can pay to anybody. You know, when we want to underscore the worth of a person, we often say he or she is the salt of the earth. So that's a great compliment. The statement about believers that you are the salt of the earth shows the influence, shows the influence that Jesus says Christians should have. 
right? You're the salt of the earth. That shows the influence that we should have. Salt is the purest of all things because it comes from the purest of all elements, the sun and the sea. If, so if Christians are to be the salt of the earth, we must be examples of purity. Christians who want to be spiritually influential must hold high standards. The presence of salt cannot be ignored. It is a positive influence. If it's present, we cannot fail. If salt is present, you cannot fail to recognize its presence. If it's absent, you miss it. If it's there, you know it. If salt is not there, you miss it. Where the salt of the earth is in the form of Christian influence, people will be aware of it. It will not always be welcome, but it will be recognized. But unless Christians are pure, we cannot demonstrate the power of the influence we are to have. If you show that you're the salt that Jesus says you are, you don't have to announce it either. People will see it. If we are the salt of the earth that Jesus says we are, you don't have to have a, you don't have to have a megaphone or a microphone. People will recognize it and know it. Now, since we are the salt of the earth, where are we supposed to unleash our preserving and purifying powers? Well, the scripture says you are the salt of the earth. So in the earth, right? Matthew 5, 13 says you are the salt of the earth. So we are to apply our influence here and now in the communities where we live, we are to apply our influence in the face of all the needs that confront us every day. We are to be the salt of the earth in the city where we live. We are to be the salt of the earth in our neighborhoods. It's our business as Christians to see that our community is a wholesome environment where young people will have the best opportunity to grow and to develop. And those of us that live in the communities can feel safe and comfortable and not afraid. We, so we ought to be the salt of the earth, Christians are in us, those of us that are here today and on the phone. We are to be the salt of the earth in Los Angeles, in California, in the United States, and in the world. Jesus said, we are the salt of the earth. The salt does its most effective work when it is in direct contact with the substance on which it is to work. For example, salt is most effective when it's placed on food. Now, many of us, because of health reasons, have to be careful of how much to use, but nevertheless, Salt is most effective when it's put on food. The point is that we are not to withdraw ourselves from the world. We are to have a positive impact on the world. You're the salt of the earth. But while having a positive impact, as, a, as the Apostle James says, we should also stay unpolluted from the world. James 1.27, James 1.27 says, Religion that God our Father accepts is pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And when Jesus prays, we are to have an impact, but we're to be unpolluted. When Jesus prayed for his disciples, and that's recorded in John chapter 17. If you get a chance, you can read that chapter. That whole chapter is Jesus' prayer. In that prayer, uh, in verses 13 to 16, is what I want to read. John 17, 13 to 16. I come to you, and Jesus is praying to his Father, and he's praying for his disciples. 
I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have a full measure of my joy within them. I have given them their word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. So we're to have an impact on this sort of earth, but we're not to be polluted by it, and Jesus prayed that we would be protected, that the Father would protect us. And salt has been a preservative like forever. In ancient times, salt was used whenever something needed to be preserved. Without, without the presence of those reflecting the character of Jesus Christ, that's Christians, okay? Without the presence of those reflecting the character of Jesus Christ and being the salt of the earth, civilization will self-destruct. In Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses seven and eight. Second Thessalonians two, seven and eight. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. So the Holy Spirit that's in us is what is holding back the power of lawlessness. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. So, without the presence of us and the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, civilization would self-destruct. Man does not become increasingly pure, but tends to become increasingly impure. That's why the presence of Christians in society is absolutely necessary if that society or civilization is to be saved from disintegration. Now here's how, here's how we should be showing that we are the salt of the earth. It's in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And it's the fruit of the Spirit that, uh, that has been placed in you, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. As Christians, we are called to be the preservatives in our society. We must be those who, by our presence, defeat corruption and make it easier for others to do good. And salt, as you know, has a flavoring influence. Without salt, food has little, if any, flavor. As Chris says, some stuff, if it have, doesn't have any salt on it, it has absolutely no flavor. So Christ is saying that the Christian is to life what salt, salt is to food. The Christian is to life and the society what salt is to food. We tend to lend flavor to life. The tragedy, the tragedy is that so many people have assumed that to be a Christian is to have no flavor in life. Now, those of us who believe that have unfortunately and wrongly concluded that. A couple of people have said some things that, that, that are noteworthy. Oliver Wendell Holmes is quoted as saying that he might have entered the ministry if certain preachers he had known had not acted so much like undertakers. There's another, there's a, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson in one of his diaries said, I've been to church today and I'm not depressed. The point is we are to act as flavor, which means we need to have flavor. Many of us have this, many of us think that in order to be a Christian, you have no flavor at all. You have no fun. You can't have fun. You can't 
laugh, but that's a wrong impression because then we are unable to be the flame that we should be. People need to discover from us the joy there is in being a Christian. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, I'm going to read this. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. Now, Nehemiah said this uh, on an occasion where uh, the priests were reading to the people and uh, they were reading the law and the people were upset. They were crying because they knew that they had disobeyed the law and there was a lot of mourning. Here's what Nehemiah said. It's chapter 8, verse 10. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Happiness depends on circumstances. Joy depends on God. If you accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, you have joy because of your faith in him and his sacrifice for us. Uh, in, in a sermon I did some time ago, I quoted a, a, a Jesuit biologist and philosopher who said, joy is the infallible sign of the presence of God. In a world that is so depressed and seems to have lost the joy of life, we as Christians are charged with the joyous responsibility of being the salt of the earth and adding flavor to life. That's our responsibility. Jesus said you are the salt of the earth. When he said that, that's a great compliment. And he didn't say just hold it there, but we're the salt of the earth. That was a great compliment. Now, these people, when, when Jesus uh, uh, gave this sermon, the people that he was talking to, and maybe we haven't either, realized how important they were and that we are. Jesus did not call us to be salt of the earth to go on the ego trip either. You know, we, we shouldn't get high and mighty because Jesus has complimented us, right? So, but he told them you're the salt of the earth. He also gave them a warning. He said they could lose their saltiness. We look at Matthew 5.13 again. Matthew 5.13 says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So we could actually sacrifice the influence that we were able to have in society. Now, salt, your pure sodium chloride as we know it, actually pure sodium chloride never loses its saltiness. However, the, the people, the Palestinians, the people in Palestine that Jesus was talking to knew that they got their salt from the Dead Sea, and that salt was not pure. In time, it could become tasteless. When that happened, that salt wasn't good for anything. It was good only to be thrown out and trampled. So Jesus gave this solemn warning that if we were not, did not uh, do what we were supposed to do at the salt of the earth, we'd lose our saltiness, uh, we would become useless because we're not fulfilling our purpose as salt of the earth. That final word of caution that Jesus gave concerning the end of salt, that it lost its saltiness, that it is that it would be thrown out and trampled. Now, what that indicates is that there would be of no good to God or anybody else. We lose our saltiness. We're no, no longer good to other people. We're no longer good to God. We ought to be the salt of the earth. So here's a question we might ask ourselves. Why is the church, I'm talking about the church universal, 
Why isn't it growing today? Why are so many people, especially young people, leaving the church? Just, just give you a few stats. Uh, the religious landscape in the U.S. continues to change at a rapid clip. In uh, uh, the Pew Research Center uh, telephone survey it was conducted in 2018 and 19. I couldn't find any any more recent data, but I suspect the trends will have continued. Uh, this, so this is from the surveys in 2018 and 19. The survey found that 65% of American adults described themselves as Christians when asked about their religion. But that's down 12 percentage points from 2009 to 2019. Meanwhile, the religiously unaffiliated share of the population, consisting of people who describe their religious identity as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular, stood at 26%, which was up from 17% in 2009. Both Protestants and Catholics are experiencing losses of population share. Why is this? Why is it happening? Perhaps, just perhaps, the salt has lost its savor. Perhaps we are not being the salt of the earth that Jesus says that we are. Well, if that's the case, is it possible? Is it possible to pour salt that's lost its savor to regain it? Can we regain our influence? Yes, it is possible. Christians, those of us who have lost our savor, can win it back by going again to the source from where we got it. God didn't place any restrictions or obstacles in anyone's way, returning to the fountain of all power and all purity. So when we've sacrificed our influence and we've, the salt has lost its savor, there's only one thing to do, and that is for us to repent and return to our first love. Let me read something to you that Jesus dictated to the Apostle John to write to the church in Ephesus. It's in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. Remember what I said. What we need to do when we feel that we've lost our savor, repent and return to our first love. So here's, what, here's what Jesus dictated to John. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these words of him, these are the words of him who holds the seven swords in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered, and you have endured hardship for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, but you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of, a, of the Nicolaitans, Nicol, Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who's victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The point of all of this, the red was to return to your first love. Return and do the things that you did when you were first saved. We have, we have never not been the salt of the earth, but we can lose our saltiness. And when we lose our saltiness, we are of no use. We don't ever want to be that because the word tells us we are also ambassadors. Jesus said, go out and, and make disciples everywhere. We are ambassadors, and because we're the salt of the earth, Jesus said we were, we're able to do that 
if we, if we exercise the fruit of the Spirit, which allows us to recharge our saltiness, that's, that's to recharge, and, and because when we begin to lose our saltiness, that's recharge by going back and realizing the fruit of the Holy Spirit that's in us, that's already there, and all we need to do is develop it. When we return to our first love, we will once more be the salt of the earth. Let's pray. Lord, you have warned us to prepare for your return, but you've also given us responsibilities in the present. Teach us what it means to live according to your purposes here and now so that we are the salt of the earth that you said we are to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, now, let's be the salt. In order to have this influence that I'm talking about, this influence where we are to influence 